So welcome back to our final part of today's event. Before he comes back on stage, let me give you a little more background uh, on our next speaker, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Mr. Taleb started out as a trader. He worked as a quantitative analyst, ran his own investment firm. The more he studied uh, statistics, the more he became convinced that the entire financial system was a keg of dynamite ready to blow. And uh, as we all know, this is pretty much what happened a little later. He predicted it before it happened. In The Black Swan, in his book, Mr. Taleb argued that modernity is too complex to understand and that black swan events, i.e. hitherto unknown events, uh, unpredicted shocks would always occur. Now, Antifragile, his uh, new book, is basically a follow-up. Uh, before, he described a problem. Now, in Antifragile, he describes what to do about it. Uh, one of the core questions is, how shall we live in a world we do not understand? Let's hear some answers. Professor Nassim Nicholas Saleh, welcome. <laughs> so, great, thanks. Do you mind lowering the lights, please? Say, it's, it's, uh, this is the only place where I'm glad you call me Professor. In New York, my friends, this former trader, called me Professor when they want to make fun of me. Supposedly, Germanic, uh, uh, German speaking countries. Uh, you know, uh, being a professor is a very good thing, very respectable. So I'm glad you called me a professor here. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about my book. We have two options. I can give a presentation or I can read from page 106 to 161 for an hour if you want. So just, okay, so, okay, so it looks like you, that's not the option for you. But please, please, I beg you lower the light. <laughs> I'll say the truth. <laughs> Let me give you an idea about why this title, Anti-Fragile, and how the idea came to me. I'm an option trader. Are there are many option traders here, derivatives traders. Okay, when I say long gamma, long volatility, how many people uh, sort of grasp what I'm talking about? Okay, so for option traders, there's n I'm gonna say is nothing new, all right, except that it extends to other areas. Not particularly intelligent, except for non-option traders, okay, the concept is completely novel anti-fragile <laughs> because there's the opposite of robust the opposite sorry of fragile when you ask someone what's the opposite of fragile to give you a robust adaptable from adaptable all that nonsense it's not resilient words like that it's not the opposite of short gamma is what long gamma so the opposite of something that short volatility is something that gains from volatility you agree the robust doesn't necessarily gain from volatility then people tell me, well, complex system have adaptable properties. I tell them, listen, the word adaptable is not gonna explain long volatility, all right? If I buy five times, the, uh, five times the normal insurance on my house, five times, w what do I wish for? Floods, fires, all that, disasters, you agree? All right, so that's not adaptable, is that, no. So the category is long volatility. The adaptable may be long volatility, but that's not the point. The problem we have, <coughs> the absence of word and vocabulary, makes things very difficult. <coughs> People understand that notion that the opposite of fragile is anti-fragile when they behave. We have a lot of words, you know, in, in, in uh, uh, slang, a lot of expressions that sort of convey the idea of long volatility. The problem is learned vocabulary doesn't have it. So when you learn it, you sort of forget about it, you see? The gentleman up here, not particularly good looking fellow, you know, we all, you know, it's not, that's not why I have his picture. The gen gentleman up here, does someone recognize him? No, Gladstone, former UK prime minister, hundred some years ago. Well, very interesting fellow. He was the, the equivalent of finance minister. And then between you know, jobs, he wrote a 1,700-page treatise on Homer. And in the treatise, he, had, he made a remark that the Greeks did not have a word for blue. 
And effectively, the ancient world did not have a word for blue. Even if you take uh, the Hebrew Bible, there's no exact word for blue. Were they colorblind? No. Some modern researchers, you know, made some tests. They realized that there are a lot of native populations that only have three words for colors. They don't have a word for blue, usually. Blue comes last. But they're not colorblind. They're biologically okay, but they're culturally colorblind. See? Likewise, we don't have a word for the opposite of fragile. So when governments want you know, to engage in action, what do they say? Well, let's not be fragile, let's be the opposite of fragile, let's be strong. Strong is not the opposite of fragile. Strong is what doesn't break, you see? So that's what, uh, so this is sort of like what my idea is about. I realized that as an option trader. I was frustrated over, you know, over my life as an option trader because people wouldn't understand that it's desirable to have things that gain from volatility. But couldn't explain it to them. The word robust is not precise enough. So anyway, this gets me to the end of my, well, trilogy on four, in four volumes, by the way, because all trilogies should be in four volumes. So I wrote Fooled by Randomness, The Black Swan, there's something called the Better Procrustes, aphorisms, and this is the end. In the first three books, I explain <coughs> that really don't understand tail events. Tail events are incomputable. Mathematically, you can show there's a limit, and you can show empirically that there's a limit. Uh, and let me explain to you how empirically there's a limit. To tell you how little we know about how fat the tails are, meaning the contribution of the rare event, there is a measure <coughs> in econometrics called kurtosis. You know what kurtosis is? It tells you how fat the tails are, you agree? How much a distribution is non-Gaussian. You take the last 40 years of data, any financial or economic or whatever, even social uh, variable. Take the last 40 years of data, there's about 10,000 pieces of da daily variations. You will notice that one day may represent 80, 90% of the kurtosis. One day in 1987, the stock market crash represents 80% of the kurtosis last 40 years. What does it mean? It means we don't know how fat the tails are in these domains. Domains that are not Gaussian, it's very hard, very hard to figure out what the distribution is for the rare events. And the world, unfortunately, is becoming more and more non-Gaussian, less and less predictable, more and more dominated by the very rare event. So, I have here a graph. They told me that you guys are professionals to give you very difficult stuff, so we're gonna get into heavy math. But I start, you know, easing into it with graphs, and then you get into the math, all right? The, uh, <laughs> start with the graphs here. We have uh, four different, uh, different, I mean, you recognize it, it's time series returns, okay? The first one, does this work? The first one here is the fragile. The fragile is literally, look at this, uh, this, all right? If you have the, the returns of this, the financial returns of this, once you have it on the table, okay, it's not gonna improve in quality. Nothing can improve it, but an earthquake can break it, you agree? So it doesn't have upside. So the fragile is what has small upside and a lot of downside. For this, the upper bound is unchanged. So the fragile is, upper bound is unchanged with some positive noise above it. So this is the fragile. And we're gonna see why it has to be so, okay, in the definition of fragile. So this, does this like, does this, if I put it on a table, but the table is slanted, so, you know, I, I don't wanna mess up my presentation in the beginning, in the end, who cares, right? The, the, if I put it on a table, all right, nothing can improve it, okay? So this is short volatility. This is precisely, um, Fragile because it doesn't like volatility. If I hear of an earthquake in Zurich, it happens here, no? Or no, in Zurich, no earthquakes. You have such a good political system that things are, <laughs> all right. So, but if there's an earthquake, let's say it's a thought experiment, this is not gonna be helped. So either unchanged or worse. So this is the fragile. 
The second graph is a very rare category of things, sorry, that can improve a lot. You can have big jump up or big jump down. Okay, let's ignore this category. It almost doesn't exist, but I had to put it there just, you know, because uh, just to make things, uh, uh, you know, uh, interesting, but it's not, it doesn't exist. The third category is a robust. Doesn't improve, doesn't degrade, doesn't really care. So the coffee cup is fragile. The Brooklyn Bridge is robust. See, it's not going to get better if you ride on it. You bring a truck, it's not going to get better. It doesn't really care, all right? It's robust. A diamond is perfectly robust. And then the fourth category is a category of things that have small downside and huge massive upside. That category needs a name. So I gave it the name anti-fragile as the opposite of fragile. I tried every language, including uh, I don't uh, uh, including Swiss German. Okay, the different varieties of Swiss German. I tried 70 languages, and of course, <coughs> not a single language has, you know, an expression that captures the point of reverse fragility. So. <coughs> Is, you know, this is the only one, a graph that has words, all right? I hate words, so I'm not going to leave it there for a long time. So is fragile what benefits from volatility, but mathematically what benefits from volatility, the benefits from cluster of things, variability, uh, time, because time mathematically is the same, almost the same as volatility. Um, incomplete knowledge, chance, chaos, uh, entropy, randomness, stressors, and error. You see? If errors don't hurt you, these are going to be neutral or positive. You're anti-fragile. So now in probability, it's very simple. Your payoff is either has a big left tail when you're, anti when you're fragile or a big right tail when you're anti-fragile. That's the idea. I'm going through graphs just to just, you know, because after lunch, supposedly, it wakes up wakes people up, all right, the graphs. But, uh, but I'm going to focus on, uh, you know, the, 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 the sequence I followed in a book later on. This book, incidentally, was written in a way to ban anyone from skimming it. Why? There's no correspondence between chapter titles and contents. OK? <laughs> all right. For example, um, chapter 14, when two things are not the same thing, all right? in Brooklyn accent. Uh, chapter uh, 12, Thales is sweet grapes. Chapter 11, the most interesting, never marry the rock star. So there's no correspondence. And even if you go subsections, same thing. I did it with the black swan. My editor said, oh, we'll never sell any copies. Three million copies later, he's sort of convinced, all right? So it works because, you know, it, 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 the, 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 but it prevents journalists from skimming it. So I'm going to follow, nevertheless, the organization of the book because readers seem to, you know, follow it. It's sort of like uh, you're, you're surprised. I want to surprise the reader at every page. That's my idea. So <coughs> we continue now. This, if I die after presenting the slides, I'd be done. This is my central idea. But it took me 23 years to be able to figure it out. 23 years to realize how universal it was. OK, 23 years. This explains how not only <laughs> what fragility is, but how we can detect it. This is in functional space. What we saw earlier is in time series space, in probability that you have a big left tail if you're fragile, big right tail if you're anti-fragile, no tail if you're robust. This, is <laughs> this explains the story, sort of the convexity argument. And I got the idea. <laughs> In, uh, there's something in Midrash Tehillim. The lights are. Can you lower the lights just a little? Mm -hmm. In uh, Midrash Tehillim, a king has a son who committed a crime. So you have to pelt him. Oof. I was getting confused with the lights. Uh, you're supposed to pelt him with big. Sorry, you're supposed to. Uh, hit him with a big slab of stone. That was a punishment. The problem is the king didn't want to kill his son. 
he had to find a solution. What was the solution? What do you think it was? You cut the stone in small pebbles and hit him on the head with the small pebbles. Okay? Very simple. We have a definition of fragility. You're in finance, no? You're fragile if a 10% move in the market hurts you more than twice a 5% move in the market. Okay? Fragility cannot be in linear exposures. Let's take this uh, other example here. If I jump 10 meters, even in Zurich, you, you tend to, be, to die, no? That's a limit. But you never know, you never absolutely know with the Swiss. You know, there always is some secret somewhere that make them survive. <laughs> anyway. So if you jump 10 meters, you die. If you jump 10 times one meter, do you die? No. I mean, we can try it if you want. If, if that was so, if the harm were linear, you see, if harm were linear, then just walking to the office will kill you, you see? Because you have so many more one centimeter jumps, you, you realize, probabilistically, and if it were harm were linear, then it would kill you. Let's go back to this curve. There are very few large stones, you see? If large stones harm you, harm you linearly, you'd be harmed by just contact with the wall, touching objects. So harm has to be something nonlinear. In other words, very simple, every additional drop in the market should hurt you more than the previous one if you're fragile. That's a, the, the very definition of fragility. Can someone, I mean, let's take any example to show why the fragile resides in nonlinear. If I smash my car against the wall at uh, 100 kilometers per hour, uh, it's not good for the car, not good for the wall, cer certainly not good for me. You agree? If instead I drive it against the wall 10 times at 10 kilometers per hour, I'm okay. It means every additional kilometer should hurt you more than the previous one. If it weren't that way, you would die, you would, you would die at, you know, from the you know, contact with the wind. So this is the argument for nonlinearity in fragility. Why is this central? This is central because it allows us to figure out what is fragile very quickly. You can figure out, for example, if uh, uh, the nonlinear <laughs> effects of uh, traffic in a city. Take, for example, New York City. If you have 100,000 cars in Manhattan, I can go to the airport in half an hour. If you have 110,000 cars, it takes me 35 minutes. <laughs> you add 10,000 more cars, then now it's an extra hour to go to the airport. So you see nonlinearities. Another way to illustrate the idea of the too big to fail, I can show here why too big is fragile, just from this graph. Just like I can show why an elephant is vastly more fragile than a rat. You don't have rats in Switzerland, no? No, but you have elephants. Uh, Hannibal didn't leave an elephant behind or anything. All right, that's true. But an elephant breaks a leg very quickly. You see, a rat, you can toss them out the window and it will laugh at you, all right? Sort of, you know, not exactly, but I mean, it's much more robust. Why? Let me show you the exact story here from the story of Societe Generale. You've heard what happened with Societe Generale. They had a trader called Kerviel, and he was hiding $50 billion uh, uh, worth of stock in the drawer. You agree? Actually, it's 50 uh, billion worth of euros. I'm sure someone here, t statistically, someone might have been working at Sargen at the time. No? Okay. So, the liquidation cost was how much, do you think? Sorry? Five billion euros, exactly. They dropped the market on average, but whatever. At the end, the last sale was 12% below where they opened. Incidentally, the New York Times had a headline the next day, markets drop from Mumbai to London on fears of re recession, all right? As if the previous day we didn't have fears of recession, all right? Anyway, so now let's think of, this explains it, of 
as a thought experiment. Instead of having Société Générale, you have 10 small banks. We call them micro Société Générale, micro, all right? And we'd have 10 rogue traders at different periods, and the panel is distributed. We call them micro Kerviel. And each would be hiding 5 billion euros in a drawer. How much does liquidation cost for 5 billion euros? How much? Close to zero. OK. Maybe 5, 10 million. Uh, I mean, it's very, very cheap to liquidate 5 billion euros. Increasingly. So this is concavity. Every incremental 5 billion euros cost you more per unit than the previous one. That's fragility. And this is how we can measure fragility. So if you get this idea, and you're an option trader, you see this is short volatility. Yes. <laughs> we just had to detect where we're short volatility in life. You see? We can figure out from here, <laughs> if a company is fragile, you lower sales 10%, see their p &L, then lower sales 10% more. If it increases, aha, you're in trouble. If it stays the same loss, then it's linear, then you say it's okay. This is sort of what we did for the IMF, and we're going to see how. Um, I'll show you later, but now let me show you. Whatever is convex is long volatility, concave is short volatility, and the best way to figure it out is with this. All right? Convex, concave. <coughs> and I did the paper for the IMF. Where is the paper? Uh, here we go. The IMF, because I blew up at uh, the gentleman, they hired me. Actually, it's a funny story. Uh, the Aska, you remember the Dominique strauss -Kahn? Okay. He was talking about black swans and sort of said, okay, let's get this guy to come over. <coughs> so I said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm here. So by the time I met them, there was a pregnant lady and he was gone. I, I, you know, given that I don't read the papers. <laughs> and then, and the first thing she said, the first thing she said, hi, I'm Mrs. So-and-so, and this is not his, all right? <laughs> okay, that was, that was, all right. And then they said, okay, can we work together on a measure of tail risk? I say, I can't measure tail risk. I can't predict future event. But I can tell you if bank A is more fragile to a tail event than blank bank B. And this is how we came up with this paper. And it may become policy, but you know the IMF, they work very slowly, very, very slowly. So it will maybe in 2071, maybe the third generation, this will survive, it will be applied. So let me come back now to this graph because it's a central graph. Look at it again. If there's an extreme, you have linear exposure up here, and you have nonlinear exposure here, okay? Look, if you have a black swan event, the difference between the two. The larger the deviation, the more the difference in hit between the two. So if you have extreme events, the nonlinear will be hurt a lot more than the linear. Now that's the definition of fragility. We can get anti-fragility as the exact opposite. 10% is a lot better for me than 10 times 1%. I'm anti-fragile. So this is standard option theory that we can apply to things and generalize. So the, the, you know, look now what we have a smile and what has a frown. That's the best way to figure out the fragile or anti-fragile. Now, I was talking to Helen, but I can't pronounce her last name uh, without, you know, her laughing. So I'll say uh, to Ellen, all right? And uh, I was talking to her and she's, uh, you know, she likes Seneca. Who figured out the idea of anti-fragility? Seneca. How? Very simple. You've heard the Stoics. Supposedly, Stoics are robust. No? In theory, they're not supposed to. They're supposed to mentally put themselves in a situation where they do not feel any pain from losses. you agree? That's what people thought, that they were like vegetables. No, that's not what they were. These guys were like option traders. They want the upside, don't want the downside. When you read Seneca, you read something you don't find in other Stoics and definitely don't find in academic papers written about Seneca because these academic papers are not written by option traders. You see? Well, Seneca, what did he do every day? He did something we're going to call the barbell. Every day, or, or every morning supposedly, he wrote off all his possessions. He was the wealthiest man in the world. 
okay? He was writing about poverty, and he had 500 desks with ivory legs. So you can imagine, and writing about poverty, all right? So what was his idea? His idea is that you should write off your possessions so you're not harmed if someone takes it away from you, takes them away from you, because you're concave, you see? You have wealth, you get used to it, it makes no difference, someone takes it from you, it's a lot of pain. He understood that. So he said, no, I'm gonna be one up on destiny. Every morning he would wake up and claim that he's poor. And effectively, to simulate you know, being poor, he would, he would fake that he's in a shipwreck and then go for, you know, to villages with, with, he said, hardly any possession and hardly any slaves, no more than two or three slaves, incidentally, by the way. So he realized it was not, his idea of poverty is very different from our idea of, of poverty, anyway. So he mitigated his downside mentally. He said, you can take away whatever you want from me, you're not gonna hurt me. That's a stoic attitude. But he kept the upside. He said, <laughs> he kept the pleasure of the upside, and then he would find his wealth again and feel okay. So this is Seneca who discovered it, and effectively, in this book now, I embed my idea of anti-fragility with Seneca's idea. The idea of Seneca about anti-fragility. So I'm gonna continue now following what we can do with this notion. We can do a lot of things. W w you know, this idea of uh, what's convex and concave. To reiterate, sorry, if I can learn to use these, it'd be obsolete by the time I figure out how to use this, but anyway. So you see, if you have more pain, mo sorry, more, uh, more pain than gain at the bottom, you are concave. If the market goes up 1%, all right, you lose more than you make if the market goes down 1%, you're concave, all right, so you're fragile. If for an equivalent move, all right, in the opposite direction, you make more than you lose, you're convex. So in one case, you're anti-fragile. So anti-fragile means make more than you lose, and fragile means lose more than you make. Very simple, Seneca figured it out. He wanted to lose less than he makes from possessions. So with, but with this, we can really have an organizing principle to look at a lot of things around. And effectively, everything I've been discussing this morning, everything I've been discussing anyway for the last 22 years, it looks like falls into this. What is fragile? What is robust? What is anti-fragile? We can have this, this categorization based on convexity to random events. This is why debt makes you fragile. When you have debt, you don't like volatility because if the, the events don't play as planned, you're in trouble. So you have to be very good at forecasting the future and you cannot make mistakes. If you have equity, you're a lot more robust. If you have, as we're gonna say, out of the money, namely venture capital and innovation stuff, then you have all the upside. So can someone suggest, so we can start already like a conversation, uh, what other areas this could be applied to? Yeah, go ahead. No, no, nobody's raising hand. But earlier they were more aggressive, no? And raising hand. Okay. So I'll, I'll continue. We're going to have a Q&A, but we wanted to uh, sort of uh, break the ice. So there's something mathematically. <coughs> I wanted a little break before the math, but we're not going to get it. Called Jensen's inequality. And uh, I'm going to uh, show you the graph and explain to you. If this brings us to medicine, okay? I do a lot better having two doses of protein today and nothing tomorrow than one dose every day. I am anti-fragile because I like, I like to have variation. I don't like steadiness. So, and we, the people in medicine don't know about this. There's a property called Jensen's inequality, which tells you if you're fragile or anti-fragile locally to something. If you'd rather have, okay, it's just to show something on convexity. I'm putting this to show numbers. Uh, for example, pulmonary uh, ventilator, you know, lung ventilators when sick people, if you give them the same dose, they don't survive. If you give them half the dose and then one and a half time, half, one and a half time, or randomly, randomized, they do a lot better than if you give them steady do dosage. 
Same thing, it looks like our body. You need stressors. So instead of getting, you know, s uh, 70 degrees temperature all the time, you have uh, 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, you know, 20 degrees, you get sometimes zero for a few minutes, and so, you know, for an average of 20 degrees Celsius, you do a lot better. So this is identifying what's antifragile in daily life is what likes variation. It's the same formula as our long volatility formula with convexity, exactly the same formula. And let's explore it a little more. I'm going to here explain it in two languages. <laughs> in English, don't cross a river that's on average four feet deep. So in other words, the average you don't really care. And then I had translated into French, OK? A convex function of an average is not the average of a convex function, all right? So in other words, say your long volatility, all right? What would you rather have? 5% move today, 5% move tomorrow? in the market, or you'd rather have 0% today and 10% tomorrow? 0 and 10, OK? If you're long volatility, you'd rather have the whole year 0 and then one day 100%. <laughs> you agree? So the average doesn't matter much. Well, this is called Jensen's inequality, and that applies to so many domains. And uh, again, it has you know, the meaning of average no longer. The more <laughs> the more the notion of average, OK? The, the less significance it has, the more it's irrelevant, okay, the more you're either fragile or anti-fragile. Simple, okay? This is why sometimes I say forecasting doesn't matter much if you forecast the river is four feet deep. You, see, you need more than the average. And I have a, a slide here to show you something. It's written in Fahrenheit, but you can translate. I have a piece of information. A grandmother spent the last two days, 48 hours, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Good news, no? 70 degrees Fahrenheit is excellent for grandmothers. You can say perfect, like 20 degrees, everybody's happy, no? That's the average. But now you have <laughs> second piece of information. The grandmother spent the first 24 hours at zero degrees Fahrenheit. It's like minus 16. And the second 24 hours at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I won't tell you it's too obscene, a high number, all right? Okay. For an average of 20 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? What do you think happened to the grandmother? Well, there you go. So the more, the more higher order effects matter, the more fragile you are or anti-fragile you are. And now there's something people don't understand. It's a denial of anti-fragility. If something is anti-fragile, okay, it likes variation, you agree? You like stressors, variation, anything. So by not giving something a stress when it wants stress and variation, what are you doing? You're harming it. I call that mistake mistaking the cat for a washing machine. We have that idea. We don't understand that anything organic, alive, likes variations and stressors. That's how it communicates with the environment. It likes some randomness in the environment. You see? The lion hunts, all right? We're one part lion, one part cow. The, the cow eats, what, salad without dressing, all right, all the time. It's very boring to be a cow. You've got so many of them, look how bored, you know, they look, you know. It's very boring to be a cow. They don't commit suicide, uh, you know, but it's very boring. So the cow doesn't have randomness in its feeding, you agree? So there's not too much Jensen's inequality effect. But how about the lion, the carnivores? How often does a lion get uh, hits a prey? Very rarely, <laughs> once, twice a week, all right? And, and typically you miss a lot of uh, hunts and, and, all right, so we're one part cow, one part lion. So therefore we should have some randomness in the way we get our protein, you agree? Well, effectively doctors are now discovering that when you deprive someone of protein for a few days, they have autophagy. They start eating their cancer cells. If you give someone if you feed someone steadily, they tend to develop, if they're prone to diabetes, they say they tend to develop diabetes, but if you feed them randomly, we feast and famine, replicate the structure of the environment, then they get, they don't have diabetes. If you do uh, intermittent fasting, it seems to be, all that comes from the same equation that we can test, it's convexity to a source of um, nutrient or not. So all of these will fall together. 
So, mistaking the cat for a washing machine, the economy is organic. You agree? The economy. The problem is, economics textbooks make it look like a clock or a watch. Adam Smith's a watch. Adam Smith understood it's sort of organic, but he thought it was like a watch. He called it a watch. This watch, actually it's a Swiss watch, it doesn't self-heal. Believe me, it doesn't self-heal. It wants you have to pay 280 francs, monsieur, you're right, to, for it. So there's no self-healing, all right? You go, you get a bill when you take it for okay, repair. Your cat self-heals, no? The problem is the washing machine, the clock, all these things need constant monitoring. The economy, if you give it constant monitoring, you kill it. If I bring a human being, if I put him in a room with absolutely zero stressors, zero stressors, okay, and or send someone, uh, spend six months reading War and Peace, you know, different translations and stuff like that, in a space shuttle, all right, uh, or a space station, and then bring back to what happens to their bone density? They can break a leg just while walking, all right, and of course they're not. Not a, a lack of exposure to viruses and and uh, and um, bacteria weakens their immune system. So everything organic that we deprive them of stressors weakens, and this is what I call the Soviet Harvard illusion: is if the economy needs stressors, so the restaurant business works beautifully because it's able to convert failure into a huge amount of uh, benefits for the collective. Fragility of components confers robustness, all right, and gains for the overall, because, you know, if, you know, every time a restaurant fails, food gets better in a, pl in a city. So, otherwise we'd be eating Soviet-style cafeteria food. Likewise, when you take the two different differences between businesses, businesses that <laughs> are supported by the state tend to become fragile. Businesses that are not, like California or the restaurant business, they use uh, randomness as, 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 uh, as fuel and benefit from it. And it's quite, this is what I, uh, I was uh, saying this morning about Greenspan, he didn't understand that if a forest, if you stifle every fire in a forest, what do you do? You let flammable material accumulate on the side and then the, the big one would be uncontrollable. If you let the forest clean itself, be much more manageable. So here, up top is a process with volatility, constant volatility. It scares people. It's like the political system in, in, in uh, Italy. You know, yeah, but it, it works. It had a lot of volatility in the newspapers, but not in real life, right? The, the bottom is political si is uh, economy after Greenspan or political system in Syria. Nothing happens till something happens. And guess what? Puff, huge jump. So the second one has fatter tails. Nothing happens than big jumps. The one up top always makes mistakes and converts them into, you know, try to use its, use its uh, variation as fuel. So this is the thing that, that uh, libertarians tend to like, that having noise in a system, constant noise is good for it. Having no noise you know, is bad for it. And there are a lot of systems that actually benefit from randomness this, uh, in, physical, in the physical world. Like you inject randomness in some system, they stabilize something called stochastic resonance or uh, something called an annealing, where randomness and noise protect the system. Now, again, the governments come in and they overstabilize, they cause this weakness. This is what's gonna happen to Saudi Arabia, but don't tell anyone. When um, in, in the Black Swan, I mentioned Syria and Saudi Arabia. One went already. One was Syria, where you have no political volatility. You stifle variation. You weaken the system, and then look what happened. And now Saudi Arabia. And it's, who's responsible for this? The United States. Foreign policy is there to repress any kind of volatility. But you, you can't keep doing that, you see, because you're weakening the system. Now, also, there's way, another thing I discuss is there's the two different businesses. As there's a business that uses error as an engine for improvement. So every time a bridge collapses, 
whether in Idaho or in Geneva, okay, every single bridge on the planet is likely to improve. You see, it gets safer. Every time a plane crashes, the next plane ride is safer for everyone. So the probability of a crash of planes drops after every plane crash. Well, that's a system that benefits from every mistake. Let's compare it to the bank. When a bank crashes, it doesn't make the next bank less likely to crash. The okay, it means the system is not built properly, which is what you get here. Systems like these, okay, where the, 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 the errors are monstrous. So and this comes from disease of uh, naive interventionism. That also happens to your health. If you, you know, were supposed to have exposure to, you know, just like the economy, to stressors and stuff like that, if you deprive yourself of stressors, you become weaker, no? Well, this is why we go to health club. They have health clubs here, no? It means there's an implicit acceptance of the anti-fragility of the human body that needs to be stressed. And this stressor comes in effect, Jensen's inequality, the same thing applies. You see, it's a lot better to uh, lift 100 pounds once and then nothing for the rest 24 hours than lift a, a tenth of a pound you know, every hour for the next, you get the idea. So it's the same as Jensen's inequality. You have gains that are convex up to a point. So <coughs> this is sort of the idea. And then with this, we can make a table, tableau in finance. What makes you fragile is a system with debt, robust, anti-fragile. In anything, biological system, efficiency makes you fragile. Redundancy makes you robust. There's something called functional redundancy, degeneracy it's called, but it's not really. It's a misnomer. So we can use this, but that here, the nation state centralized is fragile, anti-fragile, city state decentralized, anti-fragile. You guys are even one step below the city state, it's canton state, no? And then whatever a canton can do, you flows up. So you're flowing things up rather than making things come down. So this is, we can do a lot with this. So I have an extra, what, 10 minutes, uh, Ellen, before, uh, 10 minutes of presentation, and then we take Q&A, unless you're in a hurry to contradict me and raise your hand, and then we can accommodate. Now, one discovery I made was trial and error, <coughs> okay? Is that every history book of technology, every book in the history of technology makes you believe that technology comes from science, okay? And that wealth comes from education, same process. Like universities generate science, and then technologists use that science to do technology. No, you agree? What's wrong with the model? What's wrong with it? I mean, we live here in a place that contradicts the model. Yes? They're very good. So what happened? is that it looks like science comes from technology, and the mechanism, I call it lecturing birds how to fly, is that universities claim credit, <laughs> when in fact it's entrepreneurs and thinkers and people who are doers, you know, with their hands, who effectively discover things. Now, let's backtrack a little bit. Every single story of technology insists on the role of luck and serendipity, no? Uh, but then they can't integrate it. When they make a policy, they have government funding research. Well, it's incompatible with the statement that there's luck. Aha. Uh -huh. But it looks like the story of luck itself is wrong. It cannot be luck. Why it can't be luck? Because luck can harm you, <laughs> you see. It has to be a positive exposure to random events. You have to be convex to random events. So people talk about trial and error. Trial and error is a misnomer. They should say trial and small error, or trial with big upside and small downside. You see? So here I'm simulating a process, convex. There's something in trading we call the convexity bias. You can use it. You say, okay, I have two brothers. One goes by knowledge and tries to generate theories out of theories and apply them to practice. The other one does trial and error. We have very little cost of errors. It's effectively what we have in technology. This is the difference between the two processes. 
and the difference in convexity bias. This is how much knowledge can take you, and this is over a thousand years, and this is how much optionality. The fact that you have upside, you're not harmed by downside. All you need is the rationality to know that what you had, what you have is better than we had before. So what I'm saying, you know, makes sense, except that when you start reading history of technologies, I discovered the pattern. People always attribute to some scientific discovery a certain application, whether the black scholes formula, which was used in vastly more sophisticated form by traders before we had the formula, and people start blowing up when they had the formula, okay? With the banking, the Swiss bankers were like, went by gray hair because it transmitted by apprenticeship. It was not education driven, apprenticeship driven here, okay? Or you take the jet engine, or you take, uh, you know, uh, architecture. I mean, if you go to Rome and look at the monuments they have, look at the Colosseum, it's fascinating. They did not use Euclidean geometry. Euclid started appearing very late, and all, all these cathedrals were built in the 15th century. Only four people in Europe knew how to divide, okay? So they were doing all this architecture heuristically, what I call heuristic knowledge, like cooking. Cooking is a perfect model. You cannot use theory for cooking. You can't sit down, okay, I'm gonna write down the equation to generate uh, with chemical composition a, per a perfect uh, hummus dish. How do, how, do, how do you do that? Cooking is experimental. I add something, I have ob very little to lose. I give it to some, the, 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 big, the, 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 the heaviest person around, oh, sorry, so it's like Fat Tony in my book. I say, Fat Tony, is this good? He says, yay or nay. If, if he says in a Brooklyn accent, for Fat Tony of all my characters, if he says, get lost, all right, you say, okay, the, the addition's not good. So this is how it works, you see? You add, taste, or give someone to taste. So you have gains that are only experimental, and then later on someone makes the theory. So I did the, of course, there's things that were driven from theory, the nuclear uh, stuff, or in medicine, very few drugs were designer drugs. The AZT drugs, and few exceptions. The rest are side effects of other drugs. So you using, so this is that an anti-fragile system is something that converts error into gains, into growth, and stuff like that. So, and here Switzerland used to be apprenticeship based, and effectively, I looked at the data when you guys were getting rich, uh, you had the lowest level of university education in Europe. Today you have one of the highest in the world. So I'm worried a little bit. There's this myth <laughs> that uh, uh, people, you look at countries and you have a, 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 a se seemingly a, this relationship that high wealth all right, comes, corresponds to high education, therefore it comes from education. It's a reverse. Wealth comes first, and then people put their children through school and so they can call them her doctor professor, and then it stabilizes the incomes. And then we have a lot of data on that from, uh, there's like seven or eight papers. You're gonna contest it? Sorry? Yes. Yeah, ab apprenticeship is is not that category. Ah, uh, now. Ah, so you agree with my second statement. Yeah, the, Switzerland is an apprenticeship based. Apprenticeship based is a heuristic based, trial and error based system that works without big formulas, without big theories, just like medicine. When I say how medicine is growth in medicine, medicine is a pure apprenticeship based system. They teach you a theory in the morning and tell you to forget about it when you go into the, uh, you know, the hospital, all right? That's sort of like medicine or, or watchmaking, stuff like that. And theory-based knowledge is exactly what the, you know, the Sorbonne and stuff like that. This is sort of the approach. Anyway, so we can measure this, but, but we take countries like Korea, for example. Korea had a very low level of everything, okay? And then it became rich first and education followed. So we, we, there, there are a lot of uh, papers on effectively what happens when you increase education in a country, uh, whether you slow growth or not, and there's a lady called Alison Wolf who seems to believe and seems to show data that effectively increasing education slows growth. Uh, it, it, university education, that's what she means. In other words, people become 
less risk taking. So this is where America's strength is today. And the UK strength was during the Industrial Revolution. And they lost their edge now that they have what I call uh, bonus earners. You see, the risk taking, you need the risk taking, a huge amount of risk taking for trial and error when you have small downside and big upside. And, the on, and it's left now, in America's business, is visibly the computer industry, this is exactly this model. Risk taking and technologies where you have less downside than upside. And, and of course, the state can't really fund it directly, it, uh, indirectly via military spending. Some, there's some uh, lateral, uh, collateral uh, benefit, okay. So this is <laughs> the idea here that I try to promote with this view of the world is that of anti-fragility. And let's see one simple application of it. And all that, you know, all that corresponds to identifying convexity or concavity, or identifying if you have more left tail than right tail, and clipping exposure to your left tail, making yourself less fragile, keep the upside a la Seneca, and you'll be anti-fragile. And I'm going to give two or three examples, but uh, there are about 105 in the book. Okay, ways to do it. Well, you know monogamous birds? Okay, remember Jensen's inequality. The average isn't good for you, all right, when you're convex. You want a linear combination of things. But okay, it turned out that monogamous birds are not really monogamous. The female doesn't go for the big, uh, big uh, superstar. What does the female do? It finds the most boring bird, okay, within in the vicinity as a spouse, to take as a monogamous mate, and cheats with that big guy, all right? <laughs> okay. So it's a linear combination, linear combination of extremely conservative and, and a little, say 90% very conservative, 10% very aggressive, outperforms finding a medium mate, all right? It, and somehow, she, you know, the female gets a genetic diversity. She it will have the support of the boring accountant. Uh, sorry, I mean, accountants are not all boring, but the, the, in the bird domain, they're boring, all right? And keeps the genetic upside from the superstar without having to put up with the risk of having the superstar. And the combination is better than going for the average. Well, likewise, an investment. If you invest in medium risk securities, you're going to be not doing very well because we don't know what risk means. Okay? So linear combination of 90% or 80% in the lowest possible uh, uh, risk thing you can find, an asset class, well, depend how you define it. It may not be a treasury bonds, it may be a cocktail of things, what I call a repository of earnings. I don't want to make money with that. And, and one minus alpha, the remaining 10 or 20% in very, very risky securities as a cocktail, suddenly transforms you, and I call it barbell transformation, from having this payoff up there, where you can make or lose a lot of money, into a floored payoff where you're never going to go bust, you see? And then you can have more, you can keep the same upside if you leverage it. So it's a lot better to be bimodal than in the middle. And that comes from Jensen's inequality. It's the opposite of the grandmother. The grandmother wants to be right in the middle, okay? You want to achieve the middle on average without having that average. And that's the best application of anti-fragility, but it costs a lot of domains. Whether you want to be an artist, it's best to not work as an artist, to work for the city of uh, Zurich as uh, whatever, in, uh, something very, very mechanical and boring, okay? And the rest of the time, you do your art or write your novels. It's a lot better than doing it, in a, going in the middle, you see? If you want to be a good philosopher, it's much better to do it the way Spinoza did it, lens maker, the combination of lens maker and philosopher is a lot better than at the time being an academic. So, so these linear combination uh, exist in a lot of domains. And effectively, I spoke a lot about birds, but in, uh, 
in the uh, human domain, it looks like it's a case. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to be sexist and so on like that, but, uh, or want to promote uh, bad behavior on the part of uh, humans, but, uh, but it looks like we have empirical evidence that we're not too different from the birds, okay? That uh, you achieve genetic diversity and you achieve uh, fun by having a linear combination of rock star and accountant rather than have someone in the middle or someone, you know, in, in between. So, so this is, and, and there is a mathematical dimension to that. That if I have, this is my distribution of returns here, okay? If it's symmetric, it's really symmetric, let's assume it's symmetric. If I do a convex transformation, if I cut my tail, left tail, I end up with distribution this on the right, you agree? Now all distributions that are right skewed have their mean increased when you increase uncertainty. So if you, have, if you have a barbell strategy, meaning safe cash and very risky instruments, sort of like an option. When you increase volatility, what happens to the price of an option? The returns from an option are supposed to increase. Well, same thing. So this is, and, and, and this convex transformation is quite general. When you do trial and error, you're effectively on the right of that convex transformation. So this, uh, th this is a technical aspect that I explain in the book. <laughs> there are a lot of other things that um, okay, follow from it. The final one is about a problem in society where we have some people long the option are convex, meaning say you're, you're, you're a banker. If you're a banker, and, and traditionally not in Switzerland, but a banker in New York or still a banker, you have you take the upside, and when you blow up, you know, who takes the losses? <laughs> the shareholders and then the taxpayer, you agree? All right, so some people are long volatility at the expense of others. Uh, very good, so some people not being harmed by your mistakes. So I have a lot of discussion on ethics, and effectively I'm writing with two philosophers. Uh, actually, I'm writing three papers on ethics, uh, uh, using this as, uh, as the idea that um, having you know the upside where other people keep the harm and expressing it as a biggest, the biggest disease we had at no point since the beginning of civilization have we had more people with upside transferring downside to others. At no point have we had that. Now the picture I have here is that of Hammurabi. You know why? Because, sorry? Yeah, beginning of civilization, the first, okay, but so we have here this rule that led to the golden rules and led actually even to Kant and all these things. It says the following, Hammurabi, if the building collapses and kill the owner of the house, the architect is put to death. Okay, why? I mean, it's not like Hammurabi has something against architects. And also I'm translating from Mesopotamian, Babylonian, so maybe this is, he means engineer, all right, or architect. I don't know. All right. So anyway, so the text is, is precise. If the owner of the house dies, the architect's put to death. If the firstborn son of the owner is killed, the firstborn son of the architect is, you know, you bring him and put him to death. Why? Well, because the best risk management rule, when you don't have downside, you hide risk where you cut corners, and we're going to hide the risk in the foundation. And no inspector, no regulator, no one will know better about the risk than the architect or the engineer, or whoever put the house. Well, we lost that. I mean, I was an option trader. I know as an option trader, you can hide the risks. So this rule of ethic I've applied for a long time. When I left uh, banking after a while, I, 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 uh, about two decades ago, or a little less than two decades ago, I started managing money. And I would tell the clients the following. If I lose money, I won't feel guilty because I will lose a lot larger share of my net worth than you, <laughs> all right, from my loss. So long as that, that means I'm ethically calibrated, okay? But on the other hand, there's a lot of people who 
I mean, lose money, and absolutely they end up wealthy. I mean, we know a lot of them, okay? So there's an incentive of risk hiding. So it's both an ethics and risk management rule that comes from that, because options are very easy to hide. Let me wrap up very quickly before the Q&A. What I've done here is really talked about optionality as applied to life in a lot of domains. So what I'm saying is not particularly smart for option traders, except that we say, oh, you're impressed that this guy spent so much time you know, wasting time writing a book, all right? And look at the application. If you're uh, in the option world, it's obvious because you could probably write the book because you measure whatever your long gamma, whatever your short gamma, your long optionality, and you know the consequences of being long optionality, all right? And we applied it to so many domains, things that like volatility, things that don't like volatility. And we can even measure it. It's much easier to measure. But for others, they have a rough time understanding what we option traders have known for a long time. So in a way, it, I feel like we're giving back, not just me, but option and derivatives trader, back to society, all these things we've learned, <laughs> you know, and that shadowy profession that nobody knows about, or, or people know, but sort of, that it exists, but don't quite understand what, what they, we do for a living. So this is the idea, it could be applied, I'm sure, to health, to a lot of things. If I'm very ill, I'm long volatility, okay? You know, because drugs are gonna give me are more likely to help me than hurt me. But if you're perfectly healthy, whatever drug you're gonna take is more likely to hurt you than help you. So you're short volatility and stuff like that we can apply. So there are a lot of things I've done here, uh, and this is a sample of the idea, but hopefully, you know, this idea of applying option theory and option practices outside our profession hopefully will generate a more stable society. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> we started 10 minutes late, no? Uh, no, 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 all good, all good. So there would be time for questions if anyone had any questions. We yeah, still we have, have 20 minutes. Right. There is a question here in the first row. Yes, Professor. Can I give you a yeah. I think the movie li or the book Life of Pi is a very nice illustration because the guy survives on a lifeboat just because there is a tiger on board. That makes it anti-fragile. Otherwise, he would sleep and die. And because the tiger is there, he, he has to defend himself every second. And so he survives. Oh, that, that uh, and, but the, I, I also have a, 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 some doubt about this concept of anti-fragility. Of course, I understand that you can make one system anti-fragile, but the law of ent entropy uh, uh, would true. then suggest that if you make some subsystems anti-fragile, another system would become more fragile at the same point, at yeah. the same time. No, what, what ha it's a local property, and effectively things don't stay anti-fragile forever. If you keep making th things, uh, 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 the anti-fragile improves, but perfection is robust, not anti-fragile. You see, perfection is robust. Is we become, the objective is robustness, but you can't achieve robustness, and you achieve it by gaining from disorder. That was my idea. The other thing is where entropy doesn't quite apply to it, is that uh, I separate variables that are physical and perishable from variables that are informational. You see, like fads, technology, things that, like informational stuff. And, and for these, reputation, rumors, uh, books, ideas, fads, uh, and these sometimes gain from disorder. But in the end, okay, in the end, you go to the phases you go, you improve until you hit some point, and you become robust. Okay, the aims become robust, but very often people beyond that become fragile again. The other thing also, evolution is sort of anti-fragile in the sense that it likes randomness up to a point. But it takes place in layers. In a sense for evolution to work, you're breaking some eggs. So it's a top layer that's anti-fragile at the expense of fragility of lower layers. So this is sort of like how uh, Antoine Danchin wrote about it, and then he, of course, once keeps talking about Maxwell's demon all right, uh, on that. So there is a transfer of fragility for the system. If I fragilize individual parts, I strengthen the overall system. If I strengthen what's weak in a system, I fragilize the overall system. So like if you do bailouts, you're bringing 
you're stabilizing, you're defragilizing some things and fragilizing the overall system. So this is, so I agree with you on that. It is, uh, uh, this is why I, I, the book one is on anti-fragility by layers. Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. That's not my, the idea. His idea, and the one uh, I expressed it as follows, what kills me makes others stronger, you see? So you have a transfer of fragility between layers, and what we have to be careful uh, about not falling in something uh, called the naturalistic fallacy to think that nature and evolution is morally right, you see? Nature is okay operationally, but it's morally wrong, so we have to protect the very weak. But no, I agree with you on that. Uh, Gladstone wrote a book, a uh, 1,700-page book on Homer, where he discovered that uh, the Greeks didn't have a word for blue. Oh, okay. Okay, so, <laughs> the, the, and, and there are a lot of concepts that don't exist in the vocabulary, but they were not colorblind. They're, biologically, they were not colorblind, just culturally. Interesting. Um, how would you account for lack of liquidity in these long gamma trades that you have uh, explained. I mean, running a constantly long gamma position. Y you're right. At some point, you will run out of cash. Would you use you're some kind of calculator? No, no, in fact, no. L long gamma trades, uh, typically, uh, people misunderstand what I mean by long gamma trade, long convexity trades. One, trial and error comes for free. You get the idea, then the benefits. The other one, in options, if you're in a real tail of a distribution, you don't have to spend a lot of cash. Cheaper. Uh, people, do, uh, let me give you a simple idea. Test on your system a 20 sigma out of the money option when volatility is multiplied by four is multiplied by 230,000. And at the money option is linear. The more you go in a tail, the more convex you are to volatility itself. So I, I said in 87 crash, I didn't do, I did okay, but I didn't do, I realized what I did. I didn't do very well from the market move as much as I did from the explosion of volatility. And the same in 2008 is because options are very convex to pay off, and you have to go in the tail, a real tail. This is, uh, and I've written on it, you can find it on my website, Google me, you find my website. I have all these papers showing, showing the stuff. So, but you're right that typically if you buy options, uh, there's something we call the fool's put, 10% out of the money uh, uh, puts all the time. You run out of money in no time, because at the money options are very expensive, but out of money options are very convex. Trial and error is very convex. Think of Google, the payoff from Google. And you have to realize that your odds of winning are very small, but the system has high odds of winning. So to answer the professor's question again, you need a lot of entrepreneurs okay, to do trial and error for one to win. Okay? So, we, uh, so I suggest make having a National Entrepreneur Day to make it very honorable, failure very honorable. Because think about it, when Microsoft became Microsoft, it bankrupted or it replaced 50,000 software houses. So it's, you have one chance in 50,000 of having a huge revenue, <laughs> you see? And then the rest either go bust or, you know, or break even, sort of do no, no better than break even. This is incredible how concentrated this industry is. And even the stock market in America, take the stock market. The stock market is, like a, a, a big convex thing. There today listed 12,000 uh, companies. About 100,000 came in net of mergers. So you have 100,000 coming in. Half the capitalization historically has been between 50 and 400 stocks. So 50 stocks represent the, the 50 stock, half the returns of 100,000. <laughs> You get the idea. So it's, everything's like an out-of-money option in economics. In a book business, you have 600,000 books published last year in, in the English language, and about maybe 15 can feed their, their author, and one made this author very rich. Second question, if you allow me. <laughs> yes, yes. Would you take the word volafile as a legitimate substitute for antifragile? Uh, volafile? Volafile, like American file. Okay. Uh, I, I, we tried a lot of words. I tried phylostochasticity. Phylostochastic uh, phylo from phylo likes volatility. Or phylostochasticity. It didn't work. 
and I wanted to make a link. The discovery to me that was that was that was momentous is realizing that this cup was called fragile because it did not like volatility. So in fact, mapping fragility into the concept of short gamma, all right, made it more universal. You see? So but anti-fragile, now I'm stuck with it. You know, I can't go back, I can't look back. I'm a trader, you know, you don't look back. Next trade. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll think of a better word, but now I'm stuck with this one, all right, for this concept. <laughs> Any more questions? Apparently not. In that case, no, 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 thank you. Can, yeah, yeah. well. <laughs> Make the mask. Ah, oh, Let's there. See. You're right. Uh, you made reference earlier on to the fact that uh, you believe black swan events are becoming. Uh, less random and more institutionalized, I think, or more common. Yes. Uh, is that correct? And, and if so, why is that happening okay, now? Okay, uh, let me give you the data, all right? Uh, the, the fatness of tails comes from the following. There's something in nature called the island effect. The island effect is as follows. An island will have a lot more species per square meter than a continent. And if you take islands, the ratio of, of, of air, uh, the size of the, 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 the richness of per cap per is proportional to the square of the uh, one over the square of the um, of the area of the islands, which means that when the world's composed of a lot of islands, you had a lot more diversity than today, economically, culturally, everything. So what happened is that everyone has, you know, buy the same apple from the same producer. You see, so it, the the that's uh, the, the theory. Now let's look at what's happening in practice. When I wrote The Black Swan, I started looking at data from a uh, genius called Zayden Weber, who detected that as uh, between Tokyo, the earthquake of 1924, and uh, Kobe of 1994, the impact of earthquakes was accelerating uh, you know, on GDP in proportion to GDP. Okay. Now it has flown off the roof. So we have more and more data of the same natural catastrophe you can have when it hits the center a lot worse than in the past because of connectedness. A and then there's another, uh, uh, at Oxford, there's a gentleman called Bent Flatberg, all right, uh, whatever it is, all right, who uh, I'm working with him now. He looked at size of dams, size of projects, and effectively projects are convex to concave to size. So which means, that if you have a 100 uh, million pound project, you're likely to have at least 30% more cost overruns than 5% cost projects. Y you see the idea, so the, the, it means that rare events hit you, so as a random variable it's exacerbated uh, by, con by concavity. So uh, the, the world, because of optimization, is a lot more sensitive to shocks, and shocks produce vastly deeper effects. Uh, the, you know, you can look at it and, and the data shows it. The data shows it effectively that you have fewer rare events and bigger effects from the rare events. Whereas in the past we had more volatility, but no big, not the same jumps as today. So that, that's, that gives you an idea. A way to see it in the military world, before modernity, you had wars all the time, and then modern and then a century later, uh, in 1914, you had, you know, optimization and stuff, you saw it happen, okay? Fewer wars, but <laughs> deeper when they happen. Did you get a microphone? <laughs> That's why I'm pointing there. Um, wouldn't the um, Spanish flu from 19, the winter of 1917-18 be an example for the opposite? I wonder, um, at the time, there were no central, you know, like what's it called, CDC or something in Atlanta? The central uh, yeah. health so um, authority? Yeah. So you think, yeah, effectively, and we are, the, the risks today of something, yeah, to, to so, yeah, go ahead. 
Well, and nowadays, uh, in all likelihood, um, a flu of even epidemic proportions wouldn't be that that vast. And no, 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 no. The, the exact the opposite. The, today, the exact opposite. Connectedness mm -hmm. makes. Well, I'm just asking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's exactly the opposite. Connectedness. There you. The island effects tells you that random variables, we got fewer, will have less diversity, so to speak, in flus because they, now they fly on Swiss. No. Was Swiss Air before? Now it's called LX. Now Swiss, and British Air and Lufthansa, and you know we have. A, all right, so you can imagine what can happen with something equivalent to the the, the plague was traveling on horse, and look how devastating it was in 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 in, uh, in, in hitting cities. All right, that was a plague. So you can imagine. I, the next one, uh, how the next one will fly. This is why people are, are, are very sensitive. In, in, in Asia, they put these masks the minute they, 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 uh, they hear of any incident. So I think uh, the problem is both economic and this the spreading takes place much faster, will take place much faster. So the next uh, one will travel too fast, too quickly. Uh, and by the time you won't have time to, have to shut down airports. And these regulators, I don't know what they can do. We lost the island effect. There's no place to hide. I would have thought that we can contaminate it more Sorry? easily, though. I would have thought that even, though you have a point, of course, but that we can contaminate it more easily if it happens. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have, if you compare, so the, it's the same, it's the same uh, strand of research. I and mean, if you compare, what, you know, uh, our world today to our world uh, uh, century ago, you realize that connectedness is to the, you know, is towards the magnitude worse. So things move a lot faster and many more many places and literally no place to hide mm. from diseases which is why you have to be very uh, worried about and, and now you can make uh, these bacteria people can make them uh, in labs this is why now people worry about the nuclear nuclear doesn't spread as fast as bacteria is it really uh, true because in the middle age the black death took half the population away and you had a lot of islands everywhere. Yeah, th so today it would be a lot worse. <laughs> the, the, the extreme point we have in history is the Black Death, all right, the, 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 the plague, all right? The, the, that's the extreme point. So think of what, what, and we were much less connected than today, we're traveling by horseback. So think of what would happen today. Well, now we have British Air, all right? First of all, for, for some scholars, yeah. Some yeah. scholars attributing the the Renaissance thanks to the plague, uh, to, to thanks to the plague, so it was anti-fragile itself. Yeah, the world, I mean, uh, there are a lot of economic theory on UK that UK took off actually because the population was reduced, so you have fewer people to feed off the same. Th that was a lot of theories, but uh, I mean, I. But my question is uh, yeah. uh, different. Uh, what do, would you say? What do you consider more? Uh, dangerous, the existence of black swans of, or of gray ones? Same. No, no, gray swans, we gray know meaning, okay. yeah, yeah, by meaning, uh, you know, black swans, devastating effects that we do not, that they exist. Gray swans, po uh, potentially devastating effects that we choose to treat them as okay. non-harmful. Uh, let me tell you why it's a great question. When I wrote the black swan, most people misinterpreted what I meant by the black swan. <coughs> They thought that there would exist some universal black swan. All right. So is it a is September 11 a black swan? It's epistemic, based on the observer. For the pilot flying the plane into the tower, okay. Do you think September 11 was a surprise? It was not. He was flying into the tower. For people in a tower, it was had to be a surprise. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. So it's exactly what I say. The black swan for the butcher. Is not the black swan for uh, the black swan for the turkey is not the black swan for the butcher, so it's the same thing. So this makes this definition of black swan observer dependent. That's to start. So, but there's this category of object I call gray swans. Is you sort of know these extreme events can happen, say in a book business, but without any precision as to their probabilities. You see, uh, they they but they all hurt you if you're on the wrong side. What we can do here, at least with this measurement, is see how exposed you are to black swans for a given random variable. And let me uh, conclude, because I thought someone was going to ask me something. But what I proposed, very simple. When I went to the IMF, 
about uh, two and a half years ago, when or whatever, two years ago, with a pregnant lady, all right? <laughs> and then I start working with these people for free. Sim why for free? It's not like I love them, but I had to fill out 63 pages of documents, all right, to, to get paid. So I said, no, thanks, all right? <laughs> so the, the, to tell you the bureaucracy, and so, and I'm glad Switzerland doesn't belong to all these organizations. Did you guys join the UN yet or not yet? <laughs> you didn't join it yet. All these organizations are crazy, all right? Anyway, so the, the so I went to uh, there. We ended up with one simple policy. They w do a stress test to figure out if a bank is fragile. And I told them this stress test doesn't work because you're stressing and you don't know how far the event can be. And effectively, uh, a week after you know, I started working with them, there's a bank called Dexia that passed the stress test of the European Central Bank with flying colors and was in receivership like uh, seven days later, not even, all right. So I told them it's a very simple test. Whatever test stress testing you're doing, do it. So you move the market down 20%. That's fine. All you should do is do the following. Do three stress tests, 20, 25, 30. If 20% if down, you lose 100 million. 25%, you lose 150, you see? 30, you lose, uh, uh, you know, uh, 200, you're linear. But if you lose 100, 150, 600, you're gonna blow up. And in this book, I say what happened to me with Fannie Mae. In 2003, a defector from Fannie Mae, you know Fannie Mae, the firm that went bust, I've been saying to anybody who'd listen to me, doorman, anything, all right, so flight attendants, that Fannie Mae was going bankrupt. And I wrote in the Black Swan, it's going bankrupt. Why? A, a defector came to see me, to see, came to see the New York Times, all right, with the, the, the risk reports. And the journalist at New York Times called me up randomly. He said, can you come look at him? I said, present, ran to the New York Times. I said, I looked at the numbers, I fainted, right? Because I saw if this variable, credit spread or something, went up 50 basis points, they lost 500 million. Another 50 basis points, they lost an extra uh, 3 billion. And now more, 25 billion. So losses accelerate. I said, these guys are going bust. Fannie Mae. So th that was uh, in, um, in 2003. So I said it in the New York Times. That, you know, that, and of course, I got hate mail and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, they went bust eventually, but I wrote about it in the Black Swan. You know, I wanted, didn't want to miss a chance. And of course, I, I did okay when they went bust because I went and said, okay, you know, they don't want to listen to me. I'll take their money, whatever it is. So <laughs> there is a way to measure. So what we propose with the, with the IMF is the same technique. I'm saying it's not too fancy. See if you're, if the mo and rank banks based on this acceleration of losses. And the one that has more accelerated losses is much more sensitive to a tail event. So the system is in place. The problem was our bureaucracy and I have a bad reputation there because of, you, you, you understand why, all right? So uh, I've called too many people charlatans along the way. So there's some resistance, some stuff like that. But it looks like they're going to implement it. I mean, they did it as an IMF working paper. They're going to do it as an IMF white paper. And the methodology is on the web, explained clearly, of how to measure tail risk. And I'm going to get one in uh, Financial Analysis Journal, another version in, for good measure, Journal Portfolio Management, of how to do it on your portfolio. But the idea is very simple. Three tests. Take three points. If you have acceleration, be nervous. Now, people tell me, why doesn't the linear hurt you? Because if you're the linear would have hurts you, you would have already been scared by the changes in your PNL. <laughs> you see? <laughs> you see? If the linear harmed you, you would have, okay. And people tell me, what if there's a variable that's missing? My problem is in history of what I've been looking at. I've seen people put too many variables in models rather than not enough variables. So what you have to do is check convexity or concavity per variable. And that's very easy to do. And effectively, that's what option traders have been doing forever without knowing. Hmm. Is it true that you made 50 million by betting on the 
on the birth of the housing bubble in 2008. I, I, the numbers are not, not public, and the journalist <laughs> is not, but, uh, uh, I mean, but I was betting on it, so this is what the, 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 I, but the idea is, you know, you can't, and, and, and also, because I was saying it was gonna go bust after it was published, I went and said, okay, I cannot make a forecast unless I have the position. So visibly, I had to have <laughs> the position, which I had, all right? So I tell you, and I was betting they were going to go. It's not like I was betting they were going to lower. I said they're going to go bust. There's no way. You, you can tell who's going to go bust at least. If you do just find that, you're a lot better off. Hmm. Any more questions? Yeah, here in the third row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the trades I have now, I'm very afraid of inflation. So I'm, what I'm doing is I do a deal with God. If uh, I don't know if it works in Switzerland, but it usually works elsewhere. If I d give me back in 20 years 90% of what I have, and I'll be happy. <laughs> okay, it is it's because it's very very hard. I own some stocks not convincingly. I own emerging markets not convincingly. I own euros definitely not convincingly, but I'm forced to to be away from it. I own some land. I own some real estate, but it's, uh, but I'm not convinced of anything. I'd rather have something golden. Gold I can't touch it because it's too priced in. A reserve something to hedge me should not double in price, <laughs> you see? So it, <laughs> so it can't be gold. I had gold and it went up too fast. I said, no, 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 it's not supposed to double in price. I want something that doesn't go up, doesn't go down, captures inflation, my inflation, not the inflation published by Bernanke, you see? Mm -hmm. The inflation on plane tickets and wine and uh, meals in Zurich, you get the idea, all right? That kind of uh, thing. But that doesn't sound like your barbell technique, Sorry? right? But that doesn't sound as if you applied no, your no, the own barbell, barbell technique, technique. I want every, I, my problem with the barbell is I don't know the 80% to put them where. I don't have a reserve. I tried tips, inflation rate security. No, none of these are satisfactory to give me back my reserve. So I'm still working on the 80%. Right. The other 20% I have, of course, uh, venture capital things. N not really. Trial and error is the cheapest thing in the world. Trial and error. I mean, look at the returns from California. Trial and error is the cheapest thing in the world. Th that's what, what people don't realize. That options that you pay for in, the s in, in, in finance are expensive. But the ones in real life, they're so cheap, it's incredible. <laughs> the real options are a lot cheaper, uh, particularly in, in, in all these industries. The returns, because just think of... Uh, you have to include in all these returns the Googles, the big guys, and also the small guys. Okay, I think we wrap it up. Great, thank you very yeah, much. Thanks thank for you so much. To me. Thanks. I'm to be here. It's Thanks. been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.